our fruit. Hey, uh, Lord, we just thank you for what's going on here, what you stirred up. We thank you that you brought Selwyn safely here, what he's going to release. Lord, we just keep it all now under the blood of the Lamb so that it goes in deep. It bears a lot of fruit, and then we break forward with that into what's next. Spirit, just move here. We just submit this, all of this unto you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me, uh, we're going to get someone up here for you quickly, but let me just give you a, a quick thing because next week things are stirring in this month. Um, thank you, all of you who prayed for what happened in the prison on Friday. We had a large, larger event for the flight deck discipleship. And, you know, Martha was in there. Who else was? Laura, there's Laura up there, Laura back there. Was it wild? I mean, talk to these two as far as what happened there. And it was amazing because when I went back in on Tuesday for our, our normal time together, the atmosphere had shifted. It had shifted. And you could see it and feel it. And it's like, okay. So we're taking it the next step. The next round of guys is being added in there come Tuesday. Um, and God just, we'll just see. But we're doing this there, okay? Uh, the model, the carrier model, they love this. It just makes sense. It calls to them. And uh, so we're going to go forward. Hey, but next week, Daphne Swilling is a woman who's been working tirelessly for years on issues of apology to First Nations, to the Native peoples. Okay? She did some work with my sister up in Washington, D.C. on the national one that kind of got attached to a bill and sort of snuck in. That's a whole other story. But up in Tennessee, she walked this through with um, the House there, and they did a formal resolution of apology for their part in taking land and their part in the Trail of Tears. Okay? If you don't understand this, it, it's an issue of repentance. If you look back in the famine that was on the land that David had to deal with was a broken covenant, right, that Saul had walked into. And suddenly he's got the consequences. These things are real, they're biblical, and they come into the land. And so getting those addressed. Well, Daphne is now working on one in the state of Georgia. Okay? And next Thursday she'll be here. Because we connected out in Texas um, there, and she'd heard about us, and she wanted to come down. And she's going to walk you through some of those things, but also to help us move through in declaration and prayer to join in with that. It's the primary thing she wants. She knows the power of those prayers. And this is hugely important for Georgia, right? Here is, this is where it started, okay? So getting this issue through with an official apology and repentance is real important. And then we're gonna have these three wild ones back from Cuba too, which last report, they're doing great. Um, Shelly had to stay back here as the anchor person and keeping, you know, things flowing in prayer and all. But anyway, do keep them in your prayers as they're out there. And that is a very full schedule. Having been there and done that, you're in, up in the morning and, and then you have lunch and then you're on the road and you're back having dinner and you're back out on the road. And it's a lot. It, it's, uh, it's good. It's very good, but it's a lot going on. So with that, I'm going to introduce my wife, Kim, to come on up and she's going to introduce our guest. A lot of you will recognize this book. We've given out hundreds of copies. How many of these do you think you've <clears throat> actually sold? <laughs> hundreds of thousands? Oh, Millions? I wish. <laughs> um, <clears throat> This, um, I know in our group alone, probably 98% of the people that are regular people here, at the, regular folks here at the flight deck, have gone through the release from Freemasonry prayer in this book. And um, it's, it's changed a lot of lives. It's changed a lot of families. Um, so this is one that we, we're constantly taking people through. It's <clears throat> changed all of our lives. Um, tonight, Selwyn's going to move on from here, and he's going to be talking from this book, which is about dealing with generational curses and generational iniquities in our family lines. Um, 
I was fortunate, and Bill Garfield and Pam Garfield were there also a couple of weeks ago. We were up in Newark, New Jersey, when um, Selwyn taught on this, and it was incredible. I've heard Selwyn speak before on it. This is an updated version of this book. Unfortunately, on his way here, he had many stops and sold out of it. <sighs> That's what I said. That's what the stones are for. That's right. <laughs> um, but we can we can take orders. We can get it online. And we can also get it as an ebook. Um, so we do have access to it. But it's an extraordinary book. I'm very excited for you to hear him speak on it tonight. Um, he's got some great slides, um, and we're going to have it recorded, so we can also listen to it as many times as we want to. But you will learn a lot about your your families. Um, he's got some really incredible information on national curses, things around the world, and what people end up under. Um, anyway, Selwyn is um, one of my favorite speakers because he's very much a scholar. He's very interesting to listen to, but he's also a lot of fun. He's a humorist. He says all the things we think, but don't ever speak. <laughs> so you're going to really enjoy him. Just don't call him pastor. You'll get about the same reaction you get from Steve and I if you call us that. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'd like to introduce Dr. Selwyn Stevens. Georgia is one of my favorite states. <laughs> and I can prove it because the prayers in that book, the font is called Georgia. <laughs> I saw it and I thought it looked pretty good looking. <laughs> so this is what we're talking about, but before we do that, if you've got a cell phone, it would be helpful if you can mute it, unless you're on emergency uh, medical call out. Otherwise, if it goes off, it's $25 for missions. <laughs> and if you answer it, because clearly you're addicted, it'll be another 25. <laughs> so you'll do well for about 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, well firstly, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It's already tomorrow back home. I hate to, is, is that a wee bit high? That might be better. I'm, I'm just, I'd rather actually see people's faces than see a microphone. It's, it's not licorice, so I'm not likely to lick it. True friends know everything about you, but like you anyway. <laughs> now, some, some years ago, I'm trying to remember how many, it might be five, could be a bit more. I took a photo of Mount Rushmore, and I thought, that's wonderful. I, I was doing some ministry in the neighborhood, and one of the pastors took me for a little whirl out there. But I thought, have you ever wondered what it looks like from the Canadian side of the border? <laughs> and, and I thought we were talking about this today. Vegetarian is an ancient tribal name for the village idiot who can't hunt, hunt fish or light fires. <laughs> <laughs> but judging by the number of dead deer along the side of the motorway that I've been in the next, in the last few days, uh, I think Bambi's looking for mum. Now, do you know why they say never stand under a tree when there's lightning? That's why. That's a high-speed camera shot of lightning hitting a tree. You do not want to be near that unless you really want your hair straightened. <laughs> Okay. Well, this is this is interesting because this is about a password that a company did a test through the uh, through the company, and one employ employee had Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, Huey, Louie, Dewey, Donald, Goofy, and Sacramento. And when she was asked why, she said, "Huh? It has to have eight characters and a comfort and a cavern's on board." <laughs> It's just my sense of humour. I, I know how many of my friends on Facebook are paying attention when I put something like that up and, and suddenly it goes to several thousand people. Um, actually, do any of you have trouble with neighbours wandering across your yard? Because I've got a solution. <laughs> Oh, 
enlightened. <laughs> you like that, don't you? Oh. All right, we need to find where to get those from. This man wants one. <laughs> and we need the dog too. You need the dog? Yes. You haven't learned to bark? We have that hand, just the hand. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over that. That was too funny. Oh, you want that? Yeah. All right. An atheist was sitting next to a little girl on an airplane, and he turned to her and said, "Do you want to talk? Flights go quicker if you strike up a conversation with a fellow passenger." The little girl, who'd just started reading her book, replied to the stranger, "Well, what would you want to talk about?" "Oh, I don't know," said the atheist. "How about why there's no God, no heaven or hell, no life after death?" Okay, she said, those are interesting topics, but let me ask you a question first. A horse, a cow, and a deer all eat the same stuff, grass. Yet a deer excretes little pellets, while a cow turns out a flat patty, but a horse produces clumps. Why do you suppose that is? The, vis the visibly surprised atheist <clears throat> thinks about it and says, well, I have no idea. To which the little girl replied, do you really feel qualified to discuss God, heaven, hell, or life after death when you don't know crap? <laughs> and she went back to reading her book. <laughs> you like that? Oh, I better get your password and put that on Facebook tomorrow. Um, I think that'll light it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Look, I tell you what, I've stood in enough pulpits and I've looked out and thought they were all baptised in vinegar. We need a little, hum uh, you know, a bit of hilarious and, and whenever we gather, I won't call it church because church is probably the wrong word. Anyway, it's about releasing the people of God in, and their communities and nations into the blessings of God. It's all very well for you to get set free, but your job then is to set others free. Yes. Uh, I hope you understand that. So there's our web address. I think you've put a slide in later on somewhere. We're going to put it up with Okay, that's fine. If you go to jubileeresources.org, the ebooks, if you go to the shop, there's a folder with ebooks and it'll be there uh, if you're wanting any of the ones that I might mention tonight. Okay, um, so where are you with your walk with the Lord? Um, I remember asking, I've asked this in a church once. I said, how ha hands up for those of you who are hot for Jesus. And there was about half a dozen hands went up. So I said, okay, hands up those of you who are cold for Jesus. Well, no hands went up. And I said, you realise according to the book of Revelation, the rest of you are God vomit. <laughs> I left town. <laughs> but it's always an advantage because you can tell them the truth and it really doesn't matter. I'm like the Donald. I don't care what you think. <laughs> oh, okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> How about I lead you in a little prayer? Would that be alright? This is in several of the books. It's on the website. You can download it. Um, it's probably easier that you stay seated. Let's just say this together, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I renounce and turn from all lies, all preconceptions, deceptions, and self-deceptions, and all unteachableness that I or my ancestors have believed or entertained. It's coming. I confess them as my sins, and I ask to be cleansed from them by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I renounce all vows of secrecy and silence about all ungodly activities. I command every lying spirit and every spirit of deception, self-deception and unteachableness and all any other spirits associated with these sins to leave me now harmlessly on my natural breathing and it will come and not to return to me or to anyone whom I love in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come out of agreement with and renounce all shame, blame and guilt 
all fear, all fear of failure, all fear of rejection, all fear of men, all fear of offending and ridicule, and all fear of not hearing God. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are the truth, and I surrender all these areas to your Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, and whom you promised would lead me into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Some of you just got delivered. In case I don't get to the end, I'm going to bless you now. <laughs> is that all right? Because you can take a blessing anytime, right? So, may God remember you like Noah, favor you like Moses, honor you like Mary, fight for you like the Israelites, prosper you like Isaac, promote you like Joseph, intervene for you like Esther, protect you like Daniel, use you like Paul, heal you like Naaman, answer you like Elijah, anoint you like David, and keep you safe like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you reckon that'd just about do it? Okay. Before I'm going to share this, I'm going to, when I was flying over here, which is nearly three weeks ago, I had a week up in Idaho. Uh, I may have to go back to apologize. Um, had a wonderful time. Um, but while I was on the plane, the Lord said, write this down. And, and I feel that it's to be shared in uh, a number of the places that I've been in the United States these last three weeks. Um, I hear a lot of prophets say that God is about to do a new thing, and that's not wrong. But I heard him say that shortly he will do an old thing again. He wants relationship with his kids. That was always his wish, but religious tradition, even church, has gotten in the way. He's regathering the prodigals in his arms for they have no hope without him it's time to call the prodigals home to the Lord and to their families I also sensed earlier tonight that the Lord wanted me to ask you a question and I can't answer it and you don't need to out loud but are you in agreement with the righteous prayers of your ancestors Think about that. You don't need to answer to me. But he's asking that question of us. Are you in agreement with the righteous prayers of your ancestors? And then he said this. Too many Christians are wasting their lives waiting for the second coming when they haven't grasped the meaning of his first coming. So they are immobilized. I think there's a lot of people that would probably be true of. Mm -hmm. But the topic of the day that Kim asked me to speak about, now the reason that there are no books of that particular title, the other books, what, what I've got left is, is there on the table, but um, I was told to expect between 30 and 50 people in Charleston, South Carolina. But they required um, prior registration because they just wanted to know how many tea bags or coffee bags to get out. They had to change in the last fortnight the venue three times. And we had nearly 200 turn up and they just vacuumed up everything that I had almost, not quite. But it doesn't mean the best is gone, it just means some of the best is gone. So what I need to share with you is generational sin uh, how can I explain it? Sin is what we do. Iniquity is what we inherit. It looks the same, but it has a different cause. Okay, and I'll give you a little bit of unpacking. That's what it would look like. And um, she held up, Kim held up a copy of this. Um, the ebook. If you're using a Visa or Mastercard, you don't need anybody's assistance. Uh, it will give you the key for downloading it yourself. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you can always email. A curse is a warning and a wish to inflict adversity upon an enemy using supernatural powers, like a mantra, a prayer, or a magic spell, as in Harry Potter. And if any of you are encouraging your children or grandchildren into Harry Potter, you obviously hate them. 
because if you love them you wouldn't do that because it's genuine witchcraft okay um, God's blessings are conditional I'm going to summarize some of these things because I've got way too many slides there that's not unusual for me because I don't have a clock <laughs> <clears throat> and Stephen said not to worry about the clock and since I can't see one that could be good <laughs> okay the God who blesses sometimes allows things to come into our lives to bring us back to repentance you've only got to read all through the Old Testament and some of the New Testament to understand that so where do curses come from well there's five main sources the wall. firstly God does that comes as a bit of a surprise to some folks who really need to read more of their Bible Men representing God. Uh, Joshua pronounced a curse on whoever rebuilt the walls and the gates of Jericho. 500 years later, scripture records the names of the men who both lost their eldest sons when they did just that, which you would have to say was not enlightened self-interest. Relational authority might be a parent, might be a husband over a family or a father over children or even a mother. A teacher in a school even a pastor I don't know how many people my wife and I have um, ministered with over the years probably nearly 30 years now um, and and their pastor said something along the lines of if you ever leave this church you'll be cursed and I'm thinking no wonder Derek Prince called it Kara's witchcraft but a friend of mine a younger uh, couple um, live in Florida I was here I spent a couple of days with them the last time I was through here uh, his mother lives in Colombia and um, she reported to him that the parish priest said every month if you leave the Catholic Church you will be cursed well I know that because I studied the nature of curses and so on and that's why we've got a separate book uh, about the curses of Rome it's called Rome's anathemas which is a Greek word for curse um, so if your family back to 1547 were ever Roman Catholics then you have a curse that you need to deal with it's really quite simple and they're on our website in English Spanish Portuguese French Tagalog for the Philippines Afrikaans for South Africa and there's a whole bunch of others in the wind in fact while I've been away I got a request please can we have them in Slovak and Czech so now I'm waiting for somebody to ask for it in Polish. <laughs> but anyway. So, the, I mean, these things are real, folks. You need to understand. If you think this is as good as life gets, you're wrong. It can get a whole lot better. Self-imposed curses. Uh, Rebecca cursed herself. The Jews were dumb enough to say, let his blood be upon us and on our children. Mm -hmm. And in the next decade or two, it cost upwards of two million of them their lives that was dumb it might have fulfilled something but it was dumb and those who practice witchcraft that's the story of Balaam uh, you all know the story of Balaam I'm sure King Balak said I want you to curse these people before they come here and kill us all and ba um, Balaam said well I, I want the bag of gold I'll have a go three times he had a go and he learned the lesson you cannot curse what God is blessing but he still wanted the gold. So what did he do? He went back to King Balak and he said, you've got to do something that will make their God turn on them. Invite them to get involved in idolatry and send in your young people to seduce their young people and their God will abandon them. And that's exactly what happened. And I hate to say it, but it's still happening. Yeah. And we haven't woken up to that one yet. <clears throat> so the term curse occurs 173 times in the Bible which is only half the time that the word iniquity does. So obviously this is an important concept for God. Um, a real witch knows better than attempt to uh, curse a real Christian. Uh, I remember saying that in um, New Life Church in um, Colorado Springs in July of 2000. We had two and a half thousand people renouncing the Freemasonry stuff. And I think we had about 900 um, we're in danger of expiring but we promised we'd resurrect them afterwards um, so it was fine um, you know the scriptures uh, curse without cause shan't alight no weapon formed against you shall prosper it doesn't mean that a weapon won't be formed against you it means that it won't succeed 
Okay? And God says to the people of Israel, his chosen, cantankerous though they can be, ornery, I will curse those who curse you. So the Palestinians need to wake up to that if they expect to be blessed. It's really that simple. Anyway, without getting into that. So does this mean God prevents us being cursed? Well, not in my experience. I had to deal with the odd one myself. My father was a grand, uh, was a, in um, Freemasonry, was Knight Rose Croy, chaplain of his lodge. But he renounced it before he died, thank goodness. My oldest brother was a worshipful master. I just prayed because he lived in a different place and he wouldn't have listened to me. And everywhere he went, people crossed his path and said, you really ought to get out of the lodge, it's bad for you. I gave him the draft copy of that book that Kim held up before, after he left the lodge. I'd changed the spelling on one word because I thought it was wrong and he changed it back. And now he writes letters in the Christian media in Australia saying why Freemasonry is nowhere where a Christian ought to be because of the curses that it brings in. In fact, before the book was ever published, um, there was something missing. There was something, uh, there was an understanding I didn't have. And as I sought the Lord, he began to reveal it in spite of people saying, we want copies. <sighs> the strategy the Lord gave me was to explain to the wives and daughters of Masons why there was a curse in their family. Because when the girls get it, the men don't get allowed out. You follow? If they go into lodge next week, but mother finds out you're bringing curses into our family, you ain't going next week. Because you know the old story of mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> or as they say, happy wife, happy life. Okay, so it's to cause us to repent and renounce sin, revoke the authority of a curse, and to train God's children in spiritual warfare because I don't know whether you know this but you're in a battle the moment you gave your life to Jesus Amen. all those pastors and evangelists who told you your life is going to be a bed of roses from now on forgot to tell you about the pricks and the roses <laughs> might look nice might smell nice but it don't feel comfortable for quite a long time okay so Jesus read this scripture that I'm about to show you it encompasses the primary focus that he desires in us. The Spirit, capital S, only the Holy Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. It's from Luke, uh, sorry, from um, Isaiah 61. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. That's freedom in all of its manifestations. The recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them from the Hebrew that are bruised in their souls which is an awful lot of folks okay, okay. so, so the, the word, word curses, curses I, actually I actually don't, don't like, like the definition from Strong's, from Strong's. It, doesn't it doesn't say it well, well enough, enough. It's, it's like, like this. this you get you a get trickle, trickle of blessings, blessings and an awful lot of problems and usually this frustration that's, that's how you can tell, tell. I'll, I'll give you some examples there are seven Symptoms, Symptoms of a curse, curse taken, taken from, from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28 by Dr. Derek, Derek Prince, Prince, who's not with us anymore, anymore but, but um, I, just I just think, think he's probably one of, one of the best, best um, Bible, Bible teachers I've ever had the privilege of sitting under. So, so there, there are seven, seven symptoms. symptoms. Uh, uh, the bits, bits in yellow, yellow underneath, <laughs> they are simply there as examples of what people say when they're cursing themselves. So mental and emotional disorders, Repeated or chronic sicknesses, usually hereditary ones, where all the men in a family get um, uh, heart attacks in their 40s or something, and all the women get breast cancer in their 30s. There's a pattern. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment. Barrenness, miscarriages, and female reproductive problems. I've prayed for um, different women over, one in Africa, I'm going there next week. Um, this lady pastor came over to me, she said, uh, this is a lady in our congregation, she said, um, had a baby boy followed by nine miscarriages. And I just said straight out, well, that's a curse. One's unfortunate, two's interesting, three's a pattern. I look for patterns. Nine, let's pass that. 
So I said, bring her here, let's do what we need to. Well, her husband was away at work, but um, she stood in proxy for the family. I was back there a year later. I've got a photo somewhere, I should really put it in here. Um, I was back a year later at the Teachers College in Kitwe in the Copper Belt province of Zambia, and the pastor came over to me and said, do you remember me? And I said, yeah. <clears throat> you had the lady with all the, all the um, uh, miscarriages. She said, would you like to meet her? And I said, sure. She walked over with a three-month-old. You do the maths. Because <laughs> in Africa, if you don't have babies that outlive you, you're going to have a horrible old life. There's no welfare. Okay? You need to understand that in many cultures around the world. A breakdown of marriage and family alienation. People stop talking to each other. My understanding is the English are amongst the worst in the world and the Yorkshiremen are the worst of the English. And people from there tell me that's true. They live round the corner but they don't talk because they fell out 20 years ago and they've probably forgotten what it was about. I think that's pathetic. Continuing financial insufficiency, regardless of income. You can have a big income, but if it don't go round, because remember, money's made round to go round, not flat to stack. <laughs> Being accident prone. I've met a lot of people with that. And a history of su suicides and unnatural or untimely deaths. Now, I remember speaking at the Ministry to Masons conference in Indianapolis in July of 1999 and I'm going to skip over a couple of slides to show you what was in the next day's newspaper because I quoted Derek Prince when he said if you want to see a family with a curse operating in it look at the Kennedys in America now I finished I just went through this list I mean that wasn't the main part of my message I just sort of finished it off these were conservative evangelicals with a few masons thrown in for good measure well I was finished about two minutes later they turned the TV cameras off and I got swamped by the whole front three rows and I they said have you heard the news and I said well no I've been on a plane for 29 hours I'm not really sure where I am <laughs> You saw that. JFK Jr.'s plane went down that day. Sort of underscored my message reasonably good. I'll come back to the others in a minute. But, you know, Jackie Onassis that became said to JFK Jr., I don't like you fly flying a plane because a, key, a Kennedy male dies every seven years in a plane crash. Now, I went digging all over the globe what was the Kennedy? What were the Kennedys into? And the short answer is, well, from 1830, try bigamy, try sorcery, try bootleg whiskey up in Boston. Does, does that translate all right? No, I won't go there. How about Joseph Kennedy, the American ambassador to Britain prior to and the beginning of World War II, who was a Nazi sympathiser? I wonder how many Democrats recognise that. The father of one of your presidents. And he happened to make some very disparaging remarks to the captain of the ship he was coming back prior to the war breaking out because it was Rosh Hashanah and there was a rabbi with some yeshiva students and they went through it the the quote is in the book uh, when you get it if you want to do that um, and so he pronounced the rabbi pronounced a curse on every kennedy male wow. anti-semitism will do it wow. well serves him right he shouldn't have had the attitude okay here's just in case you're wondering a family with a curse and a family without a curse with a blessing Here's an example. Max Jukes, 560 descendants, um, cost the taxpayer one and a quarter million dollars in 19th century money because of all of the... I won't make political comments tonight because you've got an election on, uh, but I think you get the point. And you compare that with Jonathan Edwards, who had nearly three times the number of descendants and never cost the taxpayer a dime. And one of them even made vice president. Hmm. You know, that's a blessing. They served the nation. They served the people. Over a hundred of them were 
uh, were missionaries. So this is to show you, you see the difference between two families, one that's cursed and one that's blessed. <clears throat> Having lots of kids is okay, God says. I don't know what's going to happen to all the Muslims, because they know <coughs> that's why they're allowed four wives. But I did spend some several days with some <coughs> Amish folks who do deliverance, in case that sounds a bit oxymoronic. <laughs> and one of the pastors had six kids and the other had ten, and he said they're going to give the Muslims a run for their money. <coughs> and they had iPhones and they did deliverance. And I'm thinking, this isn't my picture of uh, Amish. Anyway, to summarise, a curse is being empowered to fail. A blessing is being empowered to succeed. I, I, that's the simplest way I can describe the whole thing. So let me just skip over it. How do you deal with them? There's three R's. Repent. Realise you made a mistake. Two, revoke. Unsay it. Cancel it. And three, replace it with a positive confession. The word confession actually means that you come into agreement with God's word. It's really that simple. Okay? Now, the word iniquity, and again, it's got a sort of a technical definition, but I prefer this one. Sin unrepented of in one generation being outworked in the next. Okay? That, that will, may help explain that. Right. So, I could be poetic, couldn't I? David stayed and played when he should have fled instead. <laughs> Although I really have a question of why a woman would have a bath on her roof. Seems a little brazen to me. If it could, most of us do it a little more privately than that. So a son rapes his stepsister, whose brother then kills that son. That's an iniquity being outworked in the next generation. Uh, John 9, the man born blind, remember the disciples said, so who sinned? Was it him or his parents? As if it could have been him if he's born blind. He has no say in the thing. Jesus didn't say, no, you've got it all wrong. He says, in this case, this is so my glory can be manifest. So he didn't challenge the concept that they were expressing. Okay? So we've all got features that look like our parents. How many of you have been told perhaps just a hands up, that you look like an uncle or an aunt or somebody in the family. It should probably be just about all of you, actually. Um, whether, you, whether it's your facial hair, I mean, your, <laughs> your, your, your hair, your facial features, even your voice. I've rung up people and I think I've got one member of the family got a totally different one, which can be a little embarrassing sometimes if you just keep talking. Okay. Um, we've all got DNA. And you know what? Every one of us is unique. Yes. Absolute unique. Like your fingerprints. Okay? You know about your X and your Y chromosome? X comes from your mother because she kissed you. Y comes from your father because he asked, why are you home late? <laughs> That's the way I remember it anyway. Okay? Well, somebody put to me the idea that maybe there's a third strand and the strand carries your blessings and iniquities down your family line. And somebody thought of it because we found it online. They've already worked out it's a triple helix. It just don't show up on a microscope. And I found that interesting because I think that's sustainable by evidence that we experience. It's a bit hard under a microscope. Okay, so how many of you want to be blessed by God? Look at that, almost everyone, isn't it? <laughs> it's really very simple, I'll summarise it. Listen to God's voice and do what he says. For those of you who didn't put your hands up, is there anybody who wants to be cursed by God? Because this is how you do it. Ignore his voice and don't do what he says. I mean, I could give you all the technical definition from scripture, but it's really that simple. See, God's not complicated. He just knows things. So, some say a Christian cannot have a curse. It was all dealt with at the cross, and that's true. Curse with, uh, the wicked one can't touch us. Curse without cause can't alight, all those things. So if you're totally perfect, and so will your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, how many generations do we need to go? For sexual sins, it has to be ten generations. 
you won't know what life's like for the rest of us, the vast majority who actually have to deal with this crap. Since we talked about that before, I'm allowed to use it <laughs> as a term. Are you? Yeah. Well, I am very mindful that that little porcelain bowl was designed by a guy called John Crapper, and that's why it's called that. <laughs> so I'm not speaking out of turn here. Did, you didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> when I was in Virginia, my, my good friend Dale said to me, I'm going to ordain you, and I said, I'm already ordained. He said, no, no, this is different. I'm ordaining you a general in the Kook Army. And I said, what's Kook stand for? And he says, keeper of odd knowledge. <laughs> so suit yourself. Anyway, I've written the answers in to help you here. So Jesus died for our sins, right? Yes. Yes. Salvation is provided, right? Yes. Is everyone then saved? No. no, because we have to individually appropriate it and say, I'm a sinner, Jesus died for my sins, now I can be restored to the Father, which is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And then we live it out, not perfectly to start with, hopefully a little better as you get older, and when you finally reach a certain age, you don't have the energy to sin. <laughs> 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 Did you say when's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, at least some of you are laughing. Your merry heart does good like a medicine, I told you. Somebody might get healed yet. <laughs> Jesus dealt with our curses. I put the answer in because the answer is right. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree, and we know that's what he did. In the same way as salvation, Jesus provided the solution, but we need to appropriate it. And the argument with people with funny theological issues is this. It's not a salvation issue. It's a quality of life issue. You can have a curse. You can have a demon. In fact, as Derek Prince said, you can have anything you want. <laughs> and still go to heaven and be with Jesus. But in the meantime, you got Klingons. That's what I'm starting to call them. And somebody needs to do the vacuuming. <laughs> and the vacuuming works best if you repent. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're on the same page? Yes, sir. Well, I'm on the next one. <laughs> Did any of you serve in Vietnam? Do you know anyone who served in Vietnam? Yes. Okay. You had nearly half a million troops there at one time or another. Okay, I'm not going. Let me summarise this because this is a quote out of a little book. There was a sect of Buddhist monks who parked themselves at the end of the military runway that all of the troop planes flew into uh, Vietnam, uh, not very far from what was then called Saigon. They cursed every troop plane that came in and all the people on it, and it's a very specific curse. Here it is, that they would be wandering men and women for the rest of their lives they would never find peace and that they would be angry for the rest of their lives now all i got a friend from florida i never met face to face but we talked on the phone and we corresponded for a while and he rang me and told me about this and i said how quickly can you get me a copy and he did and just in time i was going to melbourne australia uh, it's a city of about five million um, all of the churches in that city train their Christian counsellors together. So I was doing a day with the whole lot of them. Um, there was about 200 trainee counsellors. It was, it was a good system. I like it. Anyway, the bottom line is, uh, during one of the breaks, I'd mentioned it in the first session, during one of the breaks, one of the organisers came over to me and introduced me to this rather tall, distinguished-looking guy. We're talking late 90s here, so 20 years ago. And my guess is he'd have been about 55, maybe a little older, uh, grey hair, um, quite, you know, military in his standing. And um, he said, I was brought up in, he said, I served in Vietnam, and then he burst into tears. He said, you've just described the last 25 years of my life. And I said, well, now that we know what it is, we can deal with it until we know what it is. Now, the point is... All the ones who served in the first Gulf War to expel Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, 
the mullahs prayed the same prayer in Saudi, which is why within three years, 16% of your military had committed suicide because they didn't know how to handle this because your government didn't have a spiritual bone in its body to say, you guys need to protect yourselves. And nobody did. Now, we, I don't have any copies that's sold out, I'm sorry, but we have a small booklet. Um, it's not an e-book, it's only... Um, I don't know if it's available within America. I presume so. I've tried finding the ministry that did it, um, but they seem to have disappeared on me. So, But it's important you understand that. Now, that is in our book to s explain to people this is why it's an issue. Because you had half a million in Saudi as well for that um, we did too Australia did I mean we you know we're a family of nations we want to deal with stuff so five times a day the Muslims pray against all the infidels that's everybody else they don't care what you believe but if you're not one of them they curse you five times a day so you need to know that now if you really want to know about what's going to happen uh, we've got a few copies of that book left um, because Jesus is coming back in the lifetime of most of you in this meeting tonight. So get used to it, which means you better get ready. And the only thing you can present to him as a trophy will be other souls. And if your job is not to get him in the kingdom but clean him up, that's good too. Because healed people heal people. Hurting people hurt people. So we've got a job to do. Okay. Um, how are we going for time? Right, I'm going to skip through some of these. Um, I believe that there are 12 primary curses that Christians can have. It's not obligatory, uh, but with some it does seem to be. Um, one is just simply the power of spoken words. Um, Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Actually, if you read that in the Hebrew, it's in the hand of the tongue, because you put your hand out to grasp it. My friends who read Hebrew, I've spent the last two days with them, just upstate a little. Um, one of my friends, actually from Korea, she's in New Zealand getting her kids through uh, high school and university, and she did a pot of rice. She wanted to teach her kids something I had taught. And she put one lot, uh, well, half of it in each jar, put them in different cupboards, wrote on them what she was going to say to them. So it was just an experiment for a month to show her kids this power in your words. The one on the right, she spoke loving words to it. It was in a different cupboard. One on the left, and you can see it's the same pot, but this one's gone all brown. Wow. So that was for her kids to learn. You just be careful what you're talking about. So that was, that was her thing. Um, you can take a molecule of water. This is a guy, he's not even a Christian. I don't know if you've seen this online. Uh, he took a, wallop, a molecule of water, and at the point it freezes, he plays music or speeches to it. Let me show you what happens. Um, this is just some spring water. It's a wee bit blurry. It's not the best picture I've got. When he played heavy metal music, it fractured. When he played Bach's air for the G-string, it was quite crystalline. When he played the speeches of Adolf Hitler, it got misshapen, which doesn't surprise me. You make me sick or I will kill you. You know, it doesn't look like a water molecule. He said words of love and appreciation, it looks like my mother's engagement ring. And when he said words of thanks, it looks like we think a, ma uh, a snowflake looks like. There is power in your words. Now, the reason this is significant is that 99% of the cells in every one of your bodies are water. So when you get a bit of road rage, or somebody at work, or heaven forbid, your family slimes you, you go away and you're sort of quivering a bit maybe, and you think, I think I need to ring somebody, I just got slimed, I need somebody to pray for me. It's because all your cells have, have been affected like these, it's just to give you an example, okay? By your words you'll be justified and acquitted, said Jesus. By your words you'll be condemned and sentenced. So there's importance in your words. Yes. And they're not nice to have to eat. Okay? Um, I think I'm going to skip over this just for the sake of time, but this is about a, a family that 
needed to come back to the Lord. Yeah. And right, anyway, it's in the book. I'm not going to spend too much time. I want to get on to some of the other things. Um, racism and anti-Semitism is the second biggest curse that I keep, keep coming across. Um, Derek Prince says uh, anti-Semitism is the root of all racism. And I believe him. I've come across it. The colour of your skin is irrelevant to your character, your faith or your integrity. Okay, Constantine uh, changed things, I'm not going to go into that, but that was where it really began seriously and the Christian church has never really recovered and I believe one of the reasons we have so many denominations, although some call them abominations, uh, is because the anti-Semitism from the beginning of the church very early on, uh, by 100 AD, anti-Semitism was pretty rife throughout the non-Jewish world um, and that's part of it. So um, all the Jewish bits were removed and so on. Uh, I'm going to skip over those. God's looking at, I thought you'd like this one. Uh, there's no white church, black church, brown church, red church or yellow church. There's just the blood-bought church of Jesus. He didn't come to save skins, he came to save souls. I thought you'd appreciate that. Contrast that with the prayer of Jesus for unity of his body. You know, legs don't walk off on their own, if that's a picture you can get. <laughs> Unforgiveness, this is huge. I have put this to psychiatrists in several countries, that if people in psychiatric institutions would learn to forgive, three quarters of them could be out of there. And they've said that's probably about right. So we forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, my question would be, what part of your past will God not forgive if you are unforgiving of someone else? So if you really think about it, that's a salvation issue. Okay? Be kind to one another. Are you willing to gamble with your salvation if you are unforgiving of others? Think of it as enlightened self-interest. Uh, Kim will remember this one. <laughs> oh, she's got her camera out. <laughs> well, You've got an election on and it's not trying to be party political, but just to remind you, heaven has a, a gate, a wall and extreme vetting. Okay? Forgiveness does not mean we tolerate abuse. It doesn't mean we approve of their behaviour. It's a decision of the will, just like love is. Okay? What I've found is that most people who suffer from depression have issues of unforgiveness. They need to deal with... I, look, I know of more, well, quite a, a handful of people who are in one of those padded cells with one of the coats that does up the back. They have an experience with Jesus in there. They forgive whoever it is they needed to forgive. And within three hours, they're home with their family. I mean, one, one of the cases is a very good friend of mine, although he's getting a bit old now. Um, there's idolatry and witchcraft. I thought you'd appreciate this one. <laughs> if you're ever tempted to go and see a psychic, the, the first question to ask is, how many times have you picked the winning lotto numbers? <laughs> and if the answer is none, just say, well, you're not reliable, I'll go find a real prophet <laughs> with a different spelling. You shall have no other gods before me. Look, you know all this. I'm just going to skip things through. Um, you know about Freemasonry. I don't need to tell you. That, that looks funny, but it's probably been squashed. But anyway, um, one of my friends, that guy that rang me from Florida, when he was a Freemason in Lodge, Singapore, he said there were nine holy books on the altar side by side. They're all the same way to God. That simply is impossible or God is schizophrenic. Doesn't know his own mind. And I know that's not true, so that's why I'm safe in saying it. Okay? 
where idolatry is common, there is violence, poverty, drugs, and dictatorships by governments, which is part of the reason why Jesus needs to come back and clean it up, because we're not doing such a good job. Okay? Sexual abuse and perversion, I don't think I need to explain that too much. It's all fairly biblical. Extremely. Hurting the helpless. <clears throat> well, everything... I thought this said it very well. I put this on my Facebook page too. I put a lot of these on my Facebook page. Um, wow. It's not murder because Jews aren't actually people. And the same with... Do you know if we paused a moment for every abortion since it was made legal in the United States, we would be here for 100 years. Mm. That's how many. You didn't need to have illegals coming over your border. You've murdered a whole bunch more, and so have we. So we're not innocent of that either. So now, I won't go into it today because of time, but there's several pages about the area of arrested development, dyslexia, and so on. Our experience is that more often than not, it's a Masonic curse, okay, in a family. Uh, I can give you one example. Some friends of mine were doing ministry in this area uh, with Freemasonry using the prayer that we use and um, with a young family, just the husband and the wife, the kids were uh, somewhere else. Two weeks later, the school teacher for their eight-year-old daughter came to visit their home. Well, that just never happens in New Zealand, probably doesn't happen much here either, and said, can I speak with you, um, you know, without the children? And so, yes, so they went into the other room, said, what's the problem? They thought their daughter must have been doing something really bad. And, and the teacher said, well, your daughter has had a learning dis disability, a dyslexia and worse, uh, for quite a long time, and dyscalculia is with maths and so on, getting numbers back to front and so on. She said, but in the last two weeks, she's learning normally. What have you done? And the only thing they had done two weeks before was go through the Freemasonry prayer on behalf of their family. So there's hope for you or for your grandkids or whatever. So I just throw that out there so that you're aware of that. Um, honouring parents shouldn't need uh, an explanation. If you went a long and happy life, honour your parents. Okay, sometimes they didn't deserve it, but we honour them nonetheless. It's a bit like honouring your president, not because he's a good guy or a bad guy, but because he's the president. Okay, we, we honour the office even if we don't particularly like the man or do like him. Okay? We honoured past ones. It wasn't a problem, so, you know. Anyway, um, respect and honour begin in the home with the parents, then school teachers, then the police and other government authorities, and then God. So if there's a building of the concept of respect, it's not so difficult to then respect God. Um, I thought you'd like this one. Uh, Christmas time, I don't know whether you celebrate this, but wrap some empty boxes up and put them near the tree and every time the children act up, throw some of them in the fire. <laughs> You're going to do that, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just remember, God gives you 100% of the money he gives you from whatever source, but he expects you to give 10% back to him one way or t'other. I don't think I need to explain that, so I'm going to skip over. Um, money will come to you this week if you went to work last week. <laughs> I don't think there's any legalism here. You're mostly laughing. I don't, I'm not going to deal with this. When ritual controls our relationships, this is religion. Yeah. Test yourself. I, I'm going to go. We've got, there's a questionnaire on the spirit of religion. It's got 23 questions. No, 20, 22 questions. The 23rd one is to ask if you thought it was someone else. <laughs> in, which, in which case, it's probably you. Um, I don't know if you've seen these little hats on Catholic priests. That represents the priests to the sun god Ra and they're still doing it and not realizing it. And they have these um, hats, fish hats, 
because that's to the god Dagon. So there's a lot of paganism has taken over uh, a large part of the church, and it's not just the Catholics who do this. Episcopal do it, some Methodists do it, and so on. Um, you've seen those. Um, this square here, uh, this is a phallic symbol to the sun god, and the uh, dome represents the womb, and when you get the right sol solstice of the year, the shadow of the um, phallic symbol goes onto that and creates Tammuz in their thinking. This is Mithraism. I've actually given Kim um, uh, how to pray through that. Um, you know, it's this is all well documented. I, I'm not trying to prove something new here. Uh, but it showed me that the nature of what Catholicism has become because they've forgotten what being a follower of Jesus is and they've picked up a whole lot of others. I'm sorry to be blunt, um, but like I said, I'm leaving home, leaving town. So I could go through, there's one of them. Um, this is all well documented. I'm not going to spend time on it. Um, I don't know if you realise this, the Messiah of the Bible was conceived at Hanukkah, which is the Festival of Lights, and he was born in the fall or autumn at the Feast of Tabernacles. Actually, um, if, if my data is correct, on the 14th of September, 3 BC. Go figure. Now, I might be wrong, but that's what the information would appear to be. So um, then they hold up the round thing to represent the sun god Tammuz. I don't think they think of it in what it really meant when it was begun. <coughs> So, and then they put uh, a cross on Ash Wednesday on the forehead, T for Tammuz. So, because isn't he resurrected? The cross is empty. We need to get out of Calvary and start to get into the resurrection. That's where real life is. Pope Francis actually said, I've got the, re it's, a, it's in the, in quoted in full in the book, said uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus is dangerous and harmful. Wow and wrong. Wow. Meeting with so-called Christian leaders who seem to have forgotten yeah. that this isn't good. And Pope John Paul said there's no hell. So he's in for a little shock um, because Jesus yeah. said there is and he tells us that it's an actual place, that it's a place of physical suffering and it's irrevocable. If you go in there, you're not coming out. Purgatory is an invention. We need some truth in church. Yes. You know, we've had greasy grace for too long. I don't enjoy telling people this stuff, believe me. But we need it. This is a symbol of Satan's greatest victory. But he ain't on there anymore. In fact, he's coming back shortly. You know, if Bill Hammond and I are right, then... Um, we ain't got more than a decade and a bit before he's back because there's still a few prophecies to be fulfilled. Anyway, so who's cursed because of the anathemas of Trent adopted by the uh, Council of Trent, reaffirmed in the 1960s by the Second Vatican Council? Everyone with non-Catholic beliefs is cursed. And all Catholics are cursed because some of their beliefs are anti-biblical. So there's no winners here. We need to need to deal with it. Now that's the book um, okay. and the e-book that's available. If you really want to study it, I have to tell you it was the worst research job I've ever had to do. I had people pestering me for stuff. I'd done something about 15 years ago and I thought that'll do, but they said no, no, we need, we need a bit more information. We need provable information. I did not enjoy it at all. But the Lord can do what he likes. Being unequally yoked applies to marriage and business. I have to tell you, I've never seen a happy one yet. Now, sometimes 20 years later, a husband gets saved when the wife was all the time. I know of some like that. Yeah, they sort of improved. But imagine you wasted 20 years. And it was difficult. And you knew you were unequally yoked. But I suppose lust does things to some people. I've seen it in business where they get taken for a ride and they lose everything. Perversion of the gospel. Uh, well, Paul said, you, bring, you preach another Jesus, you're cursed by God. Okay, I'm going to skip over these. I don't really want to get gossip. I shouldn't need to explain that because none of you would do that. Um, 
Derek said that gossip is a channel through whom demons can attack a church. Okay, now, I'm not going to get into this right now, but I am going to mention, oh, this, let me back up one. 500 years ago almost, there was a curse by the Catholic Archbishop of Glasgow, Gavin Dunbar. He has a nephew of the same name who was also a clergyman. Um, these were people who were within 100 miles of the English-Scottish border. So if you know your family came from there, I've got two maps, they're in the book as well, to show then there's a high likelihood that the curse was 1,069 words and covered every body part. And there's a monument to it in the city of Stirling that's somewhere up here on the map. I haven't gone looking for it, but I know it's in north northeast um, England. So, you know, these are, these are issues we need to realise. Um, Britain, I'm not going to go through the, through the issues, they're in the book. Um, Kim's been reading it and it's your family, isn't it, you were saying. Um, the Welsh were cursed by the English and really suppressed from about the 1400s onwards. Um, the Irish, um, 850,000 Irishmen disappeared over 12 years. A lot of them were shipped to the Carolinas or the Caribbean as slaves. Then there was the potato famine. And you got a lot of them over in the States, you, some in Canada, some down our way. Uh, Australia seemed to get an awful lot, but um, they were usually put there because they were stealing stuff. Um, we were fortunate that we never got those people. Uh, the worst thing we got was politicians. So the Scots were deeply suppressed. I, I could give you lots of stuff about this, the curse of Cromwell and so on. I'm not going to go through all that stuff. Come on, get past it. Um, the, the Anglicans suppressed the Scots because they were Presbyterians and they disagreed that the king could be the head of the church on the basis that Jesus is head of the church. And they signed their names in blood in a covenant. That's, that's to be avoided. I'm, I'm just giving you... There's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, again, I didn't particularly enjoy it, but um, it was pretty tough times. Um, some of the families were thrown out. The family had been in the same place for 500 years, and their own people, were, it was just ethnic cleansing, fundamentally. It's called the clearances. New Zealand got a lot of those people. So did Canada and Australia. I'm not sure about... Uh, you've got a few Scotsmen in this country. Uh, for example, McDonald's. They're still stingy. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, and then there's the curse of Janti, which is on all Scandinavians. That was a shock. Um, there's the curse, there's ten parts to it, but basically it's false humility. Oh, you're no good. You know, it's what your teacher probably said to you when you flunked maths. So, now, it's interesting that the Prime Minister of Norway went on public television to rebuke it which I think is... So, let me finish by doing this. There are six things we look for before people do ministry. Check that they're born again. You can't do effective ministry until they are, because if you're going to evict something, they've got no protection. If they're not born again, they can't protect themselves against demons coming back. So we wouldn't even cast them out in the first place until that's happened. Secondly, have they been baptised in water with repentance? If you got a few drops of water when you're an infant, well, that's lovely. You got dedicated with water, but you didn't get baptised. You still need to do that, okay? Um, you need to be old enough and repentant, and you need to be thoroughly wet. In fact, there is something to be said for holding them under until they repent. <laughs> Thirdly, do they have the habit of daily prayer and Bible reading? Are they feeding their soul and their spirit? Okay? Fourthly, did they attend a Bible-believing, I should take the word church out there, just say fellowship, where mature disciples of Jesus can minister to one another? Fifthly, do they have an attitude of gratitude to God? And sixthly, do they have an attitude of gratitude or forgiveness to others? When those six are in place, ministry is real easy. Okay? Now, this prayer, I'm not going to lead you through it right now, it's on the website, you can download it for free. 
along with a whole bunch of others. If this has pushed any buttons in your family tonight, I really want to recommend you just go and do it. Um, I don't know where I put it. Oh, well, there's all sorts of prayers. Oh, look oh, at I've that. Also got it. I've also got a copy of it. You have. E email it to people. I will. Just, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and if you go to, if you go into the web shop, there's a whole lot of articles and stuff there. That it's free. I just haven't worked out how to put it on the main website yet. Okay. Do you understand a little more than you did when you came in? Okay. Well, if anybody needs healing, I brought oil. with frankincense and myrrh in it. Um, but if you're all totally healthy, I don't need to bother doing that. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you shalom. So we, we definitely want um, someone to pray for people. Um, if there's something that just kind of struck you as far as your family line or that you know that um, you need broken off of you, get with one of us, okay? Because, again, we don't have any more copies of the book that includes all of this, but we can, we can get them um, or we can um, somehow we can get the information to you that you need. Okay, we have a lot of this. I have a lot of it, and uh, we can point you to the right place. So don't leave here without it. Okay, make sure you get to one of us tonight. All right, all right. So speak up when you uh, you can talk to Selwyn. Make sure you don't get out without um, speaking to him for a few minutes. All right. Thank you all very much. Too much is given, much is required. So take this knowledge and break, walk it out. Go deeper. A lot of the church has no clue. Now you do. So that's a good news, bad news. The good news is now you knew, so you can do something right. The bad news, well, I don't know if it's bad news, but there's a responsibility now. Okay? Our model is the carrier. You come in here, you get what you need so that you can go out and deploy it. Okay? You got to do first in here, right? But then please... You know, get the resources, do some reading. Um, you know, again, you saw just with this, the replay will be up. Okay, we'll get it. Forward to somebody, say, you gotta listen to this thing. I'm, you know, and just get the discussion going. We want people to be free. Okay? Someone, thank you. It's always good to have you here. I love the accent, right? Yeah. Years ago, we got to travel for a while, Kim and I, in, 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 all over in Europe, and it was fun whenever you ran into a Kiwi, you know, somebody from New Zealand. They were really, they were wild adventurers. It was just really fun. Father, we thank you for what you've released here now, and we just say it will get pressed down into the good soil. And Lord, we just want to see that multiplied out, both in the way that we're able to move in more of the blessings that you want us to have, and in seeing it deployed to more and more people so there's greater and greater freedom. Lord, I pray encouragement over everyone. I pray protection over that which has been deposited here, that it can't be snatched, it can't be trampled down or choked out, but it's going to bear a lot of fruit. Father, we ask your blessing and protection on Selwyn as he continues through in his trip now to Africa. What's next? Father, watch over, we pray, over him. Lord, we love you. Help us to be faithful stewards. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.